Well, friends, my uh, family and I are thankful to be uh, with you today to, uh, to be worshiping. Thank you. It's Not only is the topic exciting, uh, but it's fun to be part of a series, a series of uh, eight weeks where you take an ancient story and apply it to modern opportunities, modern challenges, modern problems. Uh, I want to tell you up front, today we will be talking about the greatest giant of all, and that is the giant of pride. We'll be talking about the uh, the arm, uh, the armor, the weapon with which we've uh, been given to face or overcome that giant, that's humility. Uh, so there won't be any real secrets or revelation, there won't be anything that, that's really exciting. What I hope and uh, pray for each of us as we leave today is a better understanding of ourselves and where God has placed us in our journey and how to move through the challenges and opportunities, awareness and understanding, wisdom, greater uh, satisfaction that comes from fulfilling our call. So I'd like to do that uh, and start with a verse in, uh, from the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 55, we have this, it, it, it's an oft-cited uh, challenge to us because uh, I don't know if you're much like me, but I rely on reason, explanations for everything that I do. And so in uh, Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, I'm told that, yeah, Nathan, you can look for reason, you can look for logic, you can look for explanations. Uh, but be prepared to be frustrated because as the Lord tells us through this prophet, beginning in verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, for the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now here's the challenge. We need to use our brains to survive. We have a way in which to make sense of our surroundings. We identify things that are dangerous. That's, that's one of the things that our brains do. Our brains also help us to identify things that we need. We need one another. We need food and shelter. So merely to survive, our brains work in a way in which they help us identify threats and opportunities. And the way that our brains come to do this is through a series of uh, functions, like a formula. And when we see something over and over again, our brains create shortcuts so that we don't have to do the same amount of work. We just quickly recognize and we start to develop what's called neural pathways, just these really, really quick ways so that we don't have to do the same amount of work the hundredth time that we've recognized something as we've done, uh, as we had to do the first time. So, with that, we develop expectations. Ah, I've seen this before. This car runs a red light. A car, another car is coming this way. I know what's going to happen. Now, thankfully, we don't see that hundreds and thousands of times, but we have quickly, our brains have quickly trained us to know what to expect. Uh, that's all well and good. It's part of God's plan. However, this passage here, I think we don't give enough thought to. God's ways are not our ways. I cannot always take my logic and my reason and apply it to eternal principles, the gospel, and have the same expectations. In fact, our gospel minute, just a second ago, it's a perfect, uh, it's a perfect explanation. And I, I got to tell you, Brother Denny, I appreciate that you say, you made, you made it sound as if uh, it made sense. And I'm going to confess to you, it doesn't make sense. I'm not going to hire someone who's going to leave 99 sheep and go and search for the one that he or she lost. I'm not happy that you lost the one, but you better not leave the 99 and go in search of the one. But that parable is told in such a way that it, it makes it seem like it's common sense. And it's not common sense to me. So all the way throughout the Old Testament, we have themes 
of what fits this, my ways are not your ways. Uh, Later in the New Testament, Jesus tells parables, and some scholars use the phrase, reversal of expectation. It's kind of like an Alfred Hitchcock movie twist. It's not what you expected. And Jesus uses that reversal of expectation to capture our attention and make us more teachable because we're like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. So it is that there are certain themes. Uh, It's often the youngest son who is the one who's chosen for something special. This happens on multiple occasions. That's not the way the world expects things to happen. It was the oldest son who was the heir to the father's possessions, etc. And all the younger sons and daughters and the, and the wife who was left behind when the patriarch died, it all fell to that older son. But then we have these stories where the younger son, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, Joseph in Egypt, we see it again, of course, don't we, in David? Uh, it, He's the youngest of eight sons. We see this over and over again, just to kind of mix things up and keep us on our toes. Um, It's the person with the flaw who becomes the hero. Remember, God calls Moses to speak in spite of Moses' speech impediment. He's the one who can't speak very well to speak for God to the most powerful person on earth at that time, the Pharaoh. That is not what we come to expect. The Syrian general who suffered from leprosy. See a prophet in Israel to be healed. And what does the prophet in Israel tell him to do? Go wash in the dirty river Jordan. And, I mean, to his credit, I, I'm right there with him. This Syrian general just, he went through his king. He traveled a long distance. He came to be healed. And then the prophet tells him to wash in muddy water. And he says, every river in my home country is cleaner than this river here. That makes no sense. But thankfully, and you all know the story, that general servant prevailed at changing his heart, and he went and washed in the muddy river. And as such, he was healed for following the Lord's prophet's counsel. It's the smallest nation. You know, you read this history of... Israel in the Old Testament, and you could get the impression that Israel is a great nation. You read history, and Israel is in the armpit of the world. It's through this small, insignificant nation that God does great work. So over and again, the things don't make sense because my ways, says the Lord, are not your ways. And this thing, you know, continues. Um, The Savior of the world is born to a virgin. Now, think about that for a second, right? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, Born in a stable. So the king of kings is born in a place where animals sleep. Again, this, this, this theme of the reversal of expectation. His disciples, they're not rabbis and scholars. They're not powerful people in the world. They are fishermen. They are poor and they stink. And people kind of stay away from them in society. Uh, and I actually have written here, uh, you know, for certain lost sheep. Just, it does not make sense. Again, I'm not saying it's not right. It, we know it's right. Each of us have been that lost sheep. We know how good it feels. And we have experienced God's pleasure as we have repented. Now, I used to wonder, well, okay, if you've got a person who repents... And you've got 99 righteous who don't repent. And the Lord is thankful for these, but, or glorifies, these glorify God, but these don't. I'm thinking, well, they don't need to repent because they're righteous. (laughs) Righteous in this sense is righteous in their own eyes, not righteous. It's not God's righteousness that they glory in. We all, all the time, need and deserve to repent. There are always things that are hindering our relationship with God, hindering our growth and our progression. So in John, there's this story. You've heard of this story um, where Jesus heals a man born blind from birth. And how does he do it? He, 
he spits into the earth, the ground, he makes mud, and he puts mud on the eyes of the blind person. Now, I wouldn't know where to start if I, if I had to heal someone who couldn't see, but I certainly, w the last thing I would think about, rather, is putting mud in the person's eye. Every time mud or dirt or something's got in my eye, I couldn't see. That's the exact opposite of what one expects. So I got to wonder, um, well, and then there's this parable, right, where the, 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 Master, uh, loss of words there, sorry. The, the, the owner of the vineyards has some work to do, and he goes out and hires people throughout the day to get this work done. And he says, look, I'm going to pay you this much, and every person agrees, but there are some who he found, whom he found at the very beginning of the day. So they worked 12 hours, and there were some he found at the 11th hour, and they worked only one hour. They all received the amount of money that they agreed, but after everybody was being paid, those who worked all day were disappointed to see that they got the same amount of wages as those who worked for only one hour. It's not what we come to expect. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't fit logic, at least earthly logic. My ways are not your ways. The first shall be the last, and the last shall be the first. That right there is just a contradiction of contradictions, right? And then perhaps, uh, you know, we're, even the Apostle Paul refers to the experience of Gethsemane and the cross as foolishness in the eyes of the world. What God does for us in Jesus can't be comprehended using earthly reason alone. Now, I'm suspicious of something where somebody tells me, hey, look, this isn't going to make sense to the laws of logic, but trust me on this one, right? That right there is a red flag. If, if I'm being honest with you, that concerns me. And when someone says, you know, that, that which is most precious of all things, it's free. That sounds too good to be true. And you know what the world says? When something sounds too good to be true, <laughs> right? That's what the world says. And so it is that this particular story of David facing the giant Goliath is yet another example of what we don't come to expect. It doesn't seem warranted. It's a pretty cool story because it's not what we expected. Uh, Chaplain Hargis shared with me that just a few weeks ago, you also looked at the story that uh, illustrates this reversal of expectation in Gideon, this warrior. I mean, completely outnumbered. Now, we like these stories in history where the underdog overcomes. I mean, there, there's not too many, but there are some that are really cool. Just, I mean, I, I think of... Uh, <clears throat> The uh, Britons, <coughs> excuse me, in the ba on the, at the Battle of Agincourt, you know, greatly outnumbered, at least by five to one. And some historians will kind of explain, well, they had the technology of the longbow, and they had a muddy field, you know, they'll kind of explain. Well, and then people like Malcolm Gladwell, 20, 21st century, uh, you know, philosophers, they will say, you know, it actually makes all the diff it makes all the sense in the world that David would slay Goliath. No, it doesn't. I mean, he's, he's explaining about the weapon of the, the sling, and Goliath's nine and a half feet tall, so he's a big target, all this. It only makes sense after the fact. It surprised everyone. And I want to use a particular part in that story to nail down the greatest giant. For us, um, the problem is, is in David's day, when David came up on the battle to give his brothers the, f the, the bread and to give his brother's battalion commanders the cheese, as his dad asked him to do, everybody knew what the problem was. This nine and a half foot giant taunting Israel, defiling the God, the God of Israel, you couldn't miss the giant. You couldn't miss the problem. Everybody saw the problem. Like, yeah, he's a lot bigger than me. And it wasn't just that someone knew that 
if he went up against the giant, the giant was going to kill him. I mean, maybe that was the only problem for some. But others were like, you know what? I would risk my life. But if I lose, it's not just my life that's on the line. According to Goliath's taunt, whoever won, whichever champion won, the, the, those who were defeated would be their slaves. It's not just the life of the, the individual at stake there. So that's kind of tough. But the point is, it's super obvious who that giant is. The giant of pride is the exact opposite problem. Pride is flat under the radar. So easy to miss. It's easy to see pride in others, right? Have you noticed that before? Those of us who are married especially, right? You can really quickly see pride operating in your spouse's heart, right? That's just, that's so easy. Jesus says something about that, right? He says, you know, you can, you can work really hard at trying to take the speck out of somebody else's eye. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you've got a beam coming out of your own. Now, that's a funny image. I mean, I've never seen someone with a beam in their eye, but... I get that mental image, though, and he makes me laugh. It's one more way in which Jesus is the consummate, the expert, the master teacher, because he provides images to me that stick, and they help me see where it is that God has work in me. So that giant is huge between David and Goliath. The giant is even larger when we identify pride. Pride, as Chaplain Hargis identified in the announcement for today's uh, service, pride is the universal sin. There is no human being. There is no human being who doesn't suffer from it and doesn't need God to help overcome it. It is universal in the sense that every sin that you can think of or imagine or with which you've struggled has as its, as its base the foundation is pride. It's, it, it's the foundation for all sins. And so it strikes me as revelatory that if I'm going to effectively lean on God to heal me of sin, that I do so most effectively by identifying pride. So what we're going to do, we've got pride is the chief, the universal sin, not only theologians, but philosophers throughout the ages, even non-Christian philosophers have identified that they call it by different names. Hubris, for instance, is the Greek term for that cankerous pride. But we have to uh, define a word before we can help recognize it and then overcome it. Define, let me see, I think I had um, yeah, define, detect, and then in the instance of pride, we turn away. I think that might be the best term I could think of at the time. The antidote of, for pride is humility. So let's, let's talk just for a moment about pride. We use the word pride in different ways. And what makes it complicated is some of the ways in which we talk about pride are actually good, right? Right? How many of, a, how, how many of us were, were want, like to be told by parents or by teachers, I'm proud of you? That feels good, right? School pride, esprit de corps, you know, I'm proud of the uniform that I wear and, what it sta- and that for which it stands. That's not the kind of pride we're talking about. So, again, to have a meaningful conversation, we first must define our terms. Pride is enmity. E-N-M-I-T-Y. That's not a very commonly used term. It means hatred. It means opposition. And it is not as simple as I once thought that it was. Pride is opposition to God. It is an attitude of heart. It is cancerous in my disposition. And it's ever so subtle. It is not easily recognized. So pride, again, we're going to define pride as opposition to God. Um, We will then define humility 
That's another tough word because humility sounds like uh, humiliate. And even though they sound very similar, they are not the same thing. In fact, there is an army uh, publication that came out not too long ago that identified humility as something that was good, but you can have too much of it. Now, I understand what they were talking about. You know, the, the, the context for that army publication was how to be a good leader. Well, if, you think, if your understanding of humility is such that you can have too much of it, you know, you can have too much of a good thing, in, in other words, then you and I aren't talking about the same kind of humility. We're not talking about the humility exemplified in the life of Jesus. We're not talking about the humility that David sporadically through his life exemplified, but perhaps best right here as he overcomes Goliath. Humility, if pride is opposition to God, humility is openness to God. Humility means being teachable. Now, I'm 50 years old. Uh, I have a particular rank in the military. I have graduate degrees. These are all things that help me be a better instrument in God's hands. But if I think of myself as these things, if I define myself in these ways, that which allows me to be an instrument in God's hand instantly becomes a, a blessing, becomes a curse, so to speak, because of my disposition. So humility is being teachable, and if I pray and I seek God's assistance at having a humble heart, then there is no event that I experience during the day that doesn't bring wisdom to me. There is no individual with whom I interact who can't teach me something. I can't be above someone because I'm older than them. Now, those of us, I mean, those things do still matter. Age matters. The fact that I'm a parent and not a child matters. But as I interact with my own children, one moment, I'll pick up the phone the next moment, and now I'm the child and I'm talking to my father. Humility, uh, humility looks like having a clutch in which I'm constantly engaging and re-engaging, never forgetting that the person with whom I'm interacting at any given moment has wisdom for me. It's a difficult lesson for me to, it's a difficult truth for me to hold on to. So, to be clear, if pride is opposition to God and humility is openness to God, both of them are a state of mind, an attitude that, because I'm a human, doesn't stay with me. I, I don't, it's not a one, one shot, one kill, one time, and I'm done. I have to perpetually strive for it. And the striving for it is tricky in my experience. Uh, Levi, the song that you let, let us in in worship, um, boy, there was something. What was it? It was his victory. Yeah. It's his victory, not mine, right? That may sound like, okay, victory is a victory. But the crux of it is a sense of ownership. Now, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 in, to our story of David and Goliath. And, I mean, obviously the whole story is good. And hopefully through this uh, series, you, you get um, some... You get the whole, whole story laid out and shared, but what I'd like to focus on, keeping in mind, David is the youngest of eight brothers. His three oldest brothers are at the, at the battle. You've got the Philistines on one mountain, the Israelites on another, there's the valley beneath, and Goliath keeps coming out to taunt the Israelites. And let's see... Uh, forgive me. And so the, some of the Israelite soldiers are explaining to David what's going on, and David is incredulous. David can't understand 
why no one is responding to Goliath. And David says, well, hey, I'll go. And as soon as David's oldest brother hears this, David's oldest brother criticizes him. And this is what I found very instructive. Um, let's see. Um, verse 28 of 1 Samuel 17. His eldest brother uh, Eliab heard him talking to the men and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, why have you come down now? I'm sorry, why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know, yep, yep, I, and it's one of the problems with preparing in one translation and then bringing another. Uh, the NRSV that I have here says, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down just to see the battle. Um, you said pride, though. He says, I know the pride of your heart and the... And the naughtiness is what the King James says. This is the oldest brother talking to the youngest brother. He had just embarrassed him in front of the entire army. And I can relate to Eliab here. Here is something that I have learned over the years. I, I, I presume some of you have as well. Approaching scripture, there's scripture, there's Jesus and their service. Those are, your, those are your three. Approaching scripture with humility requires me to learn from all of the players in a particular dialogue or story. Now, we all see, when we, when we first come to the story, we see David. We like David. Um, maybe he's a little bit of a show-off and a know-it-all at first. Maybe we're like, hey, what's going on? But any teenage boy who can kill a lion and a bear, and then a nine and a half foot enemy giant, I mean, hey, we're talking about this guy 3,000 years later. The guy's easy to relate to. Um, even if we maybe ourselves don't think of ourselves as David, we like this guy. But there are a lot of other people in this story. Humility requires that I try to see myself in Saul, the king, in this old brother. I try to relate to them, even in Goliath. As I do, as I see things from their perspectives, I gain insight and understanding. Because yes, Goliath is an enemy. And metaphorically, he can, he can serve better than anyone else as pride, the biggest giant. But at the end of the day, even, even when we know what happened to Goliath, Goliath is still a child of God. That's hard for my brain to, to grasp, but... Humility requires that I see it from all those different angles. Humility requires that I'm nimble and I'm flexible. I'm not too rigid in my opinions. Or at least I'm not so rigid in my opinions that I can't see things from a perspective that allows me to gain greater light and knowledge, further insight. And often one of the biggest blessings that comes from when I do that, because I don't always do that, is I'm better positioned to love my neighbor as myself might be the hardest commandment of all the commandments for me to keep personally. I know the pride of your heart. I know how naughty you are. And what does David say? David says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? My friends, this may not sound very significant to you, but it has been to me. And so I share with you what I have. The bit of wisdom here is, Eliab, understandably, thinks David is motivated by self-ambition. David's thought is himself. And if he were correct, he would be right in chastising David. An older brother's duty is to correct a younger brother. He would be right in doing that. But that's not the case. Pride brings my focus on me. Pride is self-centered. It is opposition to God, but it's essentially placing me. I, I place myself on the throne because pride puts me above 
a commandment. It puts me above a law. It puts self first. But David, his response, and if this is true and we have every reason for thinking it's accurate, David says, but is there not a cause? Pride focuses on the in, inward self and humility focuses on the mission. So another reversal of expectation in Scripture that has really fed me, whosoever seeks to gain his life must first lose it. Boy, there's a contradiction, right? How are you going to get something by losing it? That makes no sense whatsoever. In earthly ways, in worldly ways, my ways are above your ways. But losing our life is another way of saying, I lose myself in the service of others. In the military, we sometimes talk about one of the rewards of military service, and not just for the service member, right? But also for the service member's family, is that you belong to something greater than yourself. This is a true principle. This has been my family's experience for almost 20 years now. It's meaningful to sacrifice and to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Well, it's kind of hard to be something bigger than the military of the United States. But being part of the church, being part of that stone cut out of the mountain without hands that rolls down, being part of the kingdom of God, well, that right there is chief of all. And so the challenge is, is that when you and I operate from a position of humility and we forget ourselves and we think only of the mission, from the worldly perspective, humility can look like arrogance. Man, look at that person. He's so full of himself. Man, she just, she's so pushy. If she's pushy for personal gain and ambition, well, like Eliab might have been correct in chastising his brother, well, okay, she's pushy. But if she's pushy because she's trying to get me to do, she's trying to get me to volunteer, to be part of an organization that will help the community, and in the process of doing so, I take another step of losing myself, then that's not pushy. She's being humble because, for all I know, she's actually shy. And she is trusting in God and following the prompting of the Holy Spirit to extend an invitation to someone else to do something she doesn't want to do herself but is still doing because she experiences the blessings of that faithfulness. Again, the world can sometimes see humility as arrogance if it doesn't have the, the lens to understand. The lens is, and you know what, I cannot look at you accurately and tell whether or not you're operating from a position of pride or humility. I mean, sometimes I'll get it right, but I, I really cannot know. The Lord looks on the heart, right? That's the tough part. But you, we can accurately look at our own selves, particularly when we have the the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, teach me where pride is ruling in my life. Let me then kind of back up so that we can identify how it is that this giant, whatever our age is, it could be the 11-year-old daughter here. Pride, as soon as we have a concept of right and wrong, as soon as we have a concept of responding to God's call for us, pride is at work. Nor should we ever think that there's a point in our lives where, yeah, I got that. Yep. I have once and for all defeated this particular giant. That's the tricky thing. As scary as it was, there is a point in time in which that giant's head was separated from his body and the Philistines were on the run. There was victory. In this particular instance, Pride is not so much related to the goal of salvation as it's related to the goal of sanctification. It is an ongoing day in and day out battle that has already been won, but you and I have to remember that it's already been won. So, I, I pray that each of us will have 
the kind of insight and understanding such that we can see pride behind our daily struggles. If I'm a student in high school, as I once was, and as some of you are now, I can be in a particular class, and the first thing that comes to my mind is how ill-prepared or poorly dressed or awkward a particular teacher or uh, instructor might be. And then I might fixate on that challenge and that difficulty. Um, That seems harmless enough, except that it's preventing me from learning. It's preventing me from realizing that that teacher is a part of the same kingdom to which I belong. And then all of a sudden I realize that my apathy, my insecurity, all of those things that oppose me in responding to who God calls me to be is grounded and rooted in pride. The interesting thing, uh, you, I, th- I think most of us have heard this before, right? Um, you take a carrot and you take a, an egg and you place both of them in boiling water. And the boiling water causes the carrot to become soft, but the egg to become hard. The same trials and challenges in our lives can affect us in two different ways, depending on whether or not we approach those challenges and trials with pride versus humility. God will have a humble people. God does not, we do not need to experience hardships and suffering in order to become humble. We merely need to repent and to stay penitent. But if that's not happening, and I'm not getting into God causing these individual challenges in our lives, those challenges will come along and they will humble us. The the difference, as I've experienced, is my willingness to be teachable. There is a particular aspect of trust that's inherent in the attitude of humility. Um, Don and I, in our family, we have three children, the oldest of whom is 22, and he's in North Carolina. Uh, We have, as parents, found it necessary to teach our children the relationship between trust and obedience. That if our children trust that we have their best interest in mind, they will obey us because the rules are set in place for their own benefit and welfare. They're not arbitrary. They're not tests or gotchas. They're not zingers. And over time, our 22-year-old, he, he'll tell you, no, yeah. it's not that mom and dad was right. It's that those rules, those principles were right. Mom and dad were merely the ones to bring them to my attention. Just as that's true between parent and child here on earth, it's also true between us as children and our heavenly father who identifies commandments and principles not that are arbitrary, but that are designed to bring us in closer and healthy relationship with God for God's glory and our eternal pleasure. So trust and obedience are necessary. Well, our oldest son and our middle son until just recently were Boy Scouts. And the, boy, the, the Scout um, law is a, a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. So what we did is we took the obedient and cheerful together. If our children truly did trust us, they wouldn't just obey us. They would obey us cheerfully. Right? Because if you know that the principle is in place for your own blessing and protection, You'll cheerfully obey, not begrudgingly obey. This is not to the teenagers in the room. This is to the teenagers in all of us, right? We're all, in some respects, at times anyway, spiritual teenagers. 
So the attitude with which we obey and follow and yield and submit to God is humility. Do we cheerfully submit? Do we cheerfully lean in? And it's a disposition that I have, it, I'll just say for, for myself and my life, I don't choose my attitude. I open myself to it, and it comes from God to me. I've often heard people describe it as choose your own weather. I don't really want to get into disagreeing with that. I'll tell you when I simply open myself to what God is already at work, it's not an, it's, it's not an issue of effort. Before the service, and I'll use this to kind of close up, Chaplain Hargis and I were having a conversation. Just last week, this congregation reflected on Jesus' temptations. That Lucifer came to Jesus and tempted him first with food. Remember at the end of his fasting for many days. He said, look, if, you're the, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. It's haunting, but Jesus was really hungry. And then you all uh, remember Jesus countered that temptation with Scripture. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself from this ledge and then angels will catch you. Taunting once again. And then all that you see before you, the world, Satan said that he would give to Jesus if he but worshipped him. Jesus, for the third time, responded by citing Scripture. I see in that a humility and another important key. When human beings are in a room and psychologists tell them, do not think about an elephant, time and again studies show that people think about the elephant. If our only strategy to overcome something is to focus on the negative, don't do X, whatever X might be, our ability to resist X is limited. We will eventually give in to whatever X is. Our response cannot only be no. And Jesus' response to Satan in these three instances was not only no. It began with a no, but it ended with a yes. He said no to Satan. He said yes to his father. Humility requires you and me when we resist temptation, when we go through the challenges of life, to focus on the yes. The yes that victory has already occurred. It's not an issue of resisting and urging and trying. It's an issue of allowing what has already happened to take place. Because ultimately, pride is opposition. So we're not fighting it, we're letting it happen. And we're letting it happen by being teachable so that we can see in all times and all places and with all people the wisdom that God has for us. My brothers and sisters, I share with you my conviction that there is nothing that you and I experience in life that if we face it, in the strength of Christ that we, will, that we cannot overcome. The challenge is, many times, we're not aware of what the particular challenge is. We just know it's pulling us down. So with increased humility, I bless you with the ability to more clearly understand the dangerous nature of pride and encourage you to continue to seek deliverance with the help that can come only from God through the Holy Spirit. And as that understanding is given to us, we can then overcome. I share that with you with the conviction that God is calling each of us, brothers and sisters, to take a higher step, the next step in our relationship with him. And I share my conviction with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.